Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who once faked his own death so he could make out with Wendy Peppercorn. Here is the captain. Lotioning and oiling. Lotioning and oiling. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are very happy to be featuring Peacemaker. That's an anytime ale by the hardworking and colorful characters over at Austin Beer Works. This is a light, flavorful Sessions beer with an AB of 5%. This is one really smooth beer. Garage grade 3 and 3 quarter bottle caps out of 5. And you know who else is quite smooth? It's these flying garage ship sailors right here. First up, a cheers to Jane. And I think she's in Georgetown, Texas. And a big shout out to Lisa in Cicero, New York. Next up, Captain, we have Graham in Walnut Creek, California. And a big we like your jib to Holly McKinney, Texas. All right. Here's a cheers to Abdul Hamid in Oakley, California. And last but certainly not least, we have a cheers to our friend Clara in Macau. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, big cheers for the B-E-E-R-U-N beer run. And for all of our old episodes, you can check out the Stitcher app, download it for free, and listen to the old episodes for free. And if you'd like to check out our bonus show off the record, check us out on Stitcher Premium. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Thursday, May 18th, 1978, Austin, Texas. It's just after midnight when 26-year-old patrolman Ralph Ablanado stopped a red 1966 Mustang on East Live Oak Street near Travis Heights Boulevard. The officer called in a code for a routine traffic violation check. The officer approached the vehicle. The driver was a young woman, Sheila Maynard. Sitting shotgun was a white male in his late 20s. The officer obtained their names and information and walked back to his patrol car. Officer Ablanado wrote Maynard a ticket for driving without a license and ran a radio check on the passenger, David Lee Powell. The check came back that Powell, 27 years of age, was a wanted man. Wanted for some minor infractions, misdemeanor theft, and two hot check charges. Ablanado got out of his patrol car, and once again he approached the vehicle. The officer was hit with automatic gunfire coming from the vehicle in front of him. The shots knocked out the rear window of the Mustang. The officer was hit several times in the arm and chest. His bulletproof vest that he was wearing which was standard procedure for Austin patrolmen in 78, was really no match for the high-powered gunfire. Ablanado went down, and the Mustang drove off. Somehow, Ablanado was able to send out a distress call. Austin PD officers rushed to the scene. Officer Joe Villegas spotted the 66 Mustang about two blocks away in the parking lot of the Travis Park Apartments. Villegas pushed the pedal to the floor, approaching the parked vehicle at a high rate of speed. As he got closer, shots were fired, coming from the Mustang. 
Villegas was able to avoid being hit. He slammed on the brakes and returned fire. Then, David Lee Powell, still in the passenger seat, pulled the pin from a hand grenade and tossed it at Villegas. Thankfully, it failed to explode. Then, the woman, Sheila Maynard, jumped out of the vehicle with her hands raised high, screaming at the officer. She surrendered. Powell flung open the passenger door and ran for the woods. By now, it was 12.30 a.m. Officer Ralph Ablanado was rushed to the nearest hospital. Officer Ablanado died shortly after arrival. About 25 police and at least two armed security officers surrounded the woods, which was estimated to be a mile long and half a mile wide. They stopped dozens of cars and pedestrians. They waited and waited, but David Powell never came out. Just after 6 a.m., it was decided that six police and two canine officers would enter the woods and go in there and get Powell. The remaining police were to maintain the perimeter. They wanted only a small amount of police officers to enter the woods to minimize the risk. They decided that no one else was to enter. They needed a set number of officers only. That way, if they saw any movement at all, they would know immediately it was not a fellow officer. In other words, they were prepared to shoot on sight. The two dogs and six officers entered the woods with flak jackets and loaded shotguns. Two armed security guards, whose shifts ended hours ago, but decided to stay and assist the police in any way they could, now decided it was time to call it a night and let the police do their jobs. Guards Charles Howard and Gary Nelson were now near Travis High when they spotted movement. The two guards with pistols drawn moved slowly towards something they saw moving in the bushes. It was a man crouched down trying to conceal himself. At a distance of about three feet, one of the guards in a stern voice instructed the man to come out. Before standing up, the man said loudly, his voice shaking, I'm not going to do anything. And he slowly emerged from the bushes. The guards handcuffed him and called the police. Police searched the bushes and found a light blue coat, a knife, and a 45 caliber pistol set in the cocked position. The man in handcuffs was 27-year-old David Lee Powell. The petty thief and hot check artist was now a cop killer. Police pushed David Powell into the backseat of a police cruiser. It was now 6.30 a.m. The sun was just starting to rise. And it was already a bad day in Austin. The sun is up in Austin, and it's the start of a new day. We go now to a different side of the city, where parents are waking their children and families are starting their morning routines. A family of six living in a nice part of the city on Rockledge Cove is preparing to leave for the day and venture out to their duties and obligations. The second youngest is John Christian. He is 13 years of age, and in the eighth grade, at Murchison Junior High School. John was even taking a special class or two, classes for exceptional students deemed to be gifted and talented. John's family is full of gifted and talented people. John's father is George Christian. George served as the press secretary for the United States 36th President, Lyndon Johnson. He then became a top advisor to Texas Governor Dolph Briscoe. John's mother, Joanne, was a respected lawyer. Now, the Christian home was near John's school, so he would walk to school. 
but not on this day. No, on this day, John did something he has never done before and would never do again. He hid in a closet and waited in silence as his parents and brothers left the house. George Christensen, as he drove off to work, heard on the radio that there had been a shootout in the middle of the night on the city's south side, resulting in the death of one of Austin City's finest. The cop killer was arrested. Back at the Christian house, John is still in the closet, listening carefully, and after several minutes of silence, he exited. The day before, he told a classmate that he was bringing a gun to school, and now it was time to go and get that gun. According to classmates of John, the day before in Mr. Wilbur Grayson's class, two things very much out of the norm took place. First, the teacher, Wilbur Grayson, who went by Rod Grayson to friends and, of course, Mr. Grayson to the students, was absent. Rod Grayson was the father of a young boy who was just about one year old. Both he and his wife, Laura Grayson, worked. Laura was a teacher at another school. Their child was not feeling well, and it was Rod's turn to stay home and take care of their boy. Grayson's gifted and talented classes would be conducted by a substitute teacher on this day. During the first class conducted by the substitute, John Christian and another student were scheduled to give a presentation. John had the floor first. For some bizarre reason, the normally quiet young man gave a loud and obnoxious presentation that was not only hard to follow, but was quite the performance. John was making all kinds of commotion, jumping up and down, waving his hands, yelling, and teasing the small crowd of students in the classroom. Several times the class erupted with screams, laughter, and general excitement for John's wild man-like performance. By the end of the class, John had taken up all of the time for that day. The other student, not getting to make his presentation, and the class was in such an uproar that he likely did not want to. The substitute quickly lost control of the class, and with John leading the way, the classroom turned very chaotic. When the bell rang at the end of the class, a fellow student said to John, You know, tomorrow, when Mr. Grayson returns, he's going to kick our butts. John said, It's okay, because tomorrow I'm going to bring a gun. The student thought John was joking. John was probably still high from his bizarre performance. And so the student simply replied, yeah, I'll bring one too. Now back to the morning of Thursday, May 18th. John retrieved his Browning 22 caliber rifle that his parents got him for Christmas. This was Texas and a teenage boy will learn to shoot and hunt. Later, John would tell psychiatrists, that he spent several minutes contemplating killing himself. But he didn't. Instead, he made sure that the gun was loaded and he marched off to school like a soldier in some kind of secret battle. But in many ways, it was more like a hunting expedition as his enemies were unaware that there was a war brewing inside of John's head. They didn't even know that they were targets. The following is according to Texas Monthly, who like all of their work did a phenomenal job with their story on this case. Class had already started without John Christian. And what transpired next is based on the recollections of eight eyewitnesses in the classroom, as well as those of others at school that day. Sitting as he always did, not behind his desk, but on his stool directly in front of the students, Mr. Grayson had begun by asking his students What the hell had happened the previous day? The students acknowledged their own misbehavior, but added, Mr. Grayson, John was acting so weird. The teacher waved them off. He said, you just don't understand him the way I do. Then Mr. Grayson said, where is John anyway? Class had begun. John is absent. There he is, someone exclaimed directing their attention to a figure outside of the classroom window who was heading down the grassy hill beside the football field. And someone else said, he's got a gun. 
What occurred in the next two minutes would be remembered through trauma's kaleidoscope. John stepped into the doorway. Seeing him, Mr. Grayson may have smiled. Maybe he even laughed. Grayson said, Okay, John, the joke's over. John held the gun at his hip, pointed at his teacher, and a classmate heard him say, The joke's on you. Yeah, 13 year old John Christian with his 22 caliber rifle shot his teacher in the chest, the head, and the arm. The description given by the other students there that day say that Grayson was hit three times just in the locations that you said. And as he was hit, he fell from his stool and collided with the student's desk that was immediately in front of him. Mm -hmm. They say his tall, lean body thudded heavily to the floor. Blood was pouring out of one of his ears. His eyes were still wide open. And they say that he looked terrified. Now, as John turned and walked out without a word, the classroom exploded into screams. The students began to flee. Several ran to the principal's office and told the administrators at the front desk what had just happened. But of course, there's no way for them to believe them. You know, there's there's no reaction that that can really be warranted right here. They're they're in disbelief. One of the kids is yelling, God damn it, he killed him. God damn it, he killed him. The gym class was already underway. This was going on outside of the school over by the football field. A few kids saw John toss the rifle against the bicycle rack and then run up the slope. He's running away from the school. An athletics coach witnessed John fleeing the scene. He decides he's going to jump in his truck and follow the kid. He caught up to John and he jumped out of his truck and he grabbed the boy. He says, what did you do? John said, I shot Mr. Grayson. Mm -hmm. So John was taken to the principal's office. And of course, the police were called and paramedics as well. The police and really no one else could believe what had happened that morning. A 13-year-old student shot and killed his teacher in front of 21 other 8th grade students. John was arrested and his classmates were bussed off to the police station to give statements and to answer any questions that the police may have. Describing the event decades later was a man, Peyton Smith. He was the student that was nearest to Mr. Grayson when the shooting began. He said, lives were shattered. Lives were changed. Every person in that room was a victim. But what a heroic thing the phys ed teacher did. I mean, because we know John is homicidal. He did not, he, he saw the gun, but he didn't know if John had another gun on him. Yeah. I mean, he saw, he may have seen the gun being tossed over by the, the bicycle rack. Who knows if he heard the shots because this teacher is outside. Mm-hmm. And of course, by his own recollection he's saying as soon as i caught up to the boy and grabbed him i asked him what he did so he may not have fully been aware of what went down although he was like you said heroic enough and and smart enough to go apprehend the boy this part of the story is a little weird to me captain because it i don't really know where this boy intended to go what what was his intentions after shooting his teacher he didn't turn the gun on his fellow classmates He shot the teacher, and that seemed to be his only target. He walks out of the building, throws the gun down, and starts heading up the the hill. Who knows if he was heading back home or where his, what his intentions were, I don't know, because it's no mystery who committed this crime. It's not like he's fleeing the crime to, so nobody knows that it was John that did it. Yeah, I believe if he was suicidal before the shooting that he was probably going to go back home and and possibly uh, decide to be suicidal at home. And this case is such a weird case in itself. But then let's think about the whole situation for the Austin police department. 
They spent the whole night before in a six hour standoff against a guy that killed a cop in a, what should have been a routine pullover. Right. They probably thought there's no way that this day can get any worse than this. We've done our work probably for the next several weeks. You know, we've had one of the hardest days, most tragic days that we will have maybe of the whole year. We lost one of our own, a young officer. And then just hours later, a few hours later, they're responding to a school shooting. Well, as officers were going back home, you know that there was one officer after this long night saying, all right, boys, you guys get some sleep and we'll take care of it from here. And it can't get any worse. And then it did. Right. And weirdly enough, this is the same city that experienced the Charles Whitman rampage at the University of Texas at the tower just 12 years earlier. Right. There's something in the water. Ooh. Buy bottled water. Don't drink that water, right? <laughs> but if they weren't able to get John alive, they might not get as many answers to why this tragic event happened. Speaking of answers there, Captain, George Christian, John's successful father, he was asked several questions that evening by reporters that were positioning themselves on the front lawn at the Christian house. On the advice of his attorney... He said very little. He told the press that the gun used did come from the Christian house. Mm -hmm. He said he would say nothing else because he didn't want to run the risk that any of his statements would hurt his boy, who was still yet to face trial. George did ask reporters about the 28-year-old teacher that was killed, and George became very emotional when he was told that Rod Grayson had a wife and a small child. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to the great state of Texas. I do have a couple notes. Go on for the, it. On the first part. First of all, we we did cover the Charles Whitman case. That's episode number 20. <laughs> 229? That's episode number 229. And I believe that was with me and Justin from Generation Y. That's my favorite episode. Of Best episode Country. of all time. And also... This case seems very familiar, different set of events, but people probably remember the hit song Jeremy by a band Pearl Jam. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Del, Deli, it's D-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which that happened uh, January 8th, 1991. He shot himself in front of his English class, but it, it seems very familiar. And oddly enough, that happened in Richardson, Texas, in an English class, which shares some similarities to the case that we're discussing. Captain, I want to jump back and expand on the story that we started in today's trailer. David Lee Powell was born in Texas in 1951. David grew up on the family farm, and he was raised Catholic. And the Powell family, they were well-known and respected in their small Texas town. David excelled in school. By high school, it was determined that David was an exceptionally bright and gifted student. He told his parents and teachers that he wanted to become a doctor. Now, David graduated high school at the age of 16 as valedictorian. Wow. He applied to the University of Texas. This was their Plan 2 program, which was designed for only the best and brightest young students. One of several requirements for admission was to submit an essay. David wrote an essay on how he wanted to be a doctor so he could help people. Now, I don't know the particulars of this next bit, but several sources reported that David 
I'm guessing maybe in this essay or something else that David did, but he was on record as correctly predicting the fall of the Soviet Union, including the how, why, and when. And all of this with great accuracy. Mm -hmm. David was accepted to the university with what is said to be the highest ever recorded SAT score submitted to UT's prestigious program. Austin, Texas and college life was very, very different from the farm and country life that David was accustomed to. At school, David was swept up with the changing world. He became a true believer in the society of youthful thinkers and activists. But David was seduced by something else while away at school. The nightlife, the wild parties, and more specifically for David, the drugs. Captain, this led to the old turn on, tune in, and drop out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The old LSD. There you go. David dropped out of school and spent the next several years traveling this great big country. Mm -hmm. Now, by 1978, David was addicted to methamphetamine. Not only was he using on the daily, but he was manufacturing and he was a street pusher as well. In the 70s, it was widely believed that methamphetamine was non-addictive. But, of course, we know that that is completely false. It's the old, hey, try this drug. It's recreational. You can have fun with it, and whenever you want to, you can just stop. Well, no, you can't because you're addicted. At one point, David was so desperate to stop using. Now, we got to keep in mind, this was the mid to late 70s. So rehab was not so readily available like it would be today. The resources were just not there in the way that they are now. Yeah, I mean, if he wanted to get help today, he could check himself into a rehab clinic. But since that wasn't available, he went to his doctor and said, hey, I'm taking drugs and I'd like to stop. Yeah, so the doctor trying to help David out prescribed something called Silert. Now, I've not heard of this drug, and that makes sense because this drug has since been banned. The side effects for this stuff are terrible. Some patients taking this drug experience psychosis. During all of this mess, this is when David asked a former girlfriend, Sheila Maynard, to drive him out of town. This out-of-town trip was for the purpose of David selling about four to $5,000 worth of meth. I could not determine if Sheila was fully aware what the trip was for. Mm -hmm. And we know how that ended, that trip, with David in a shootout and cuffed and thrown in a cell. Both David and Sheila were initially charged with capital murder. Sheila turned witness for the state's case against David Powell. She testified for the prosecution against David. The charges against Sheila were then reduced. She was sentenced to 15 years but got out on good behavior. This was after four. Officer Ablanado was a good cop and a decorated officer. He was married with two small children. He was only 26 years old when he was shot and killed. David was convicted of capital murder in September of 1978, and he got a death sentence. He went off to Texas's death row and then off to Rusk State Hospital for the criminally insane. After several months there, he was returned to death row. Now, most of his years in prison, he had a good amount of privileges. He worked, frequented the library. He taught many of his fellow prisoners how to read. He became an advocate for the mentally and physically disabled. David was even featured in a film documentary about the Texas death row. Because of how bright David was, he could better articulate life on death row than the others that were interviewed. He became the main interview for the documentary because of his compelling descriptions of life on death row. Over the years, David went through several trials and of course the appeals process. There was the argument that information was not presented at David Powell's trial that could have affected his sentencing. This was the argument that David was not the only shooter the thought here, Captain, was both of these individuals, David and Sheila, were in the vehicle. 
So David's defense is trying to make the argument that Sheila was shooting as well. Mm. And there were some statements that said that Sheila could have possibly been the one that threw the grenade at Officer Villegas. People argue this and say, you know what? If this had come out, and if it, in fact, it is true, because we have, for every one person that said Sheila was involved in the shooting and may have thrown the hand grenade, mm-hmm. there's a person that says no, that Powell was the only one to be shooting at the cops and trying to take people out that day. So the people against the death penalty have always argued if this information would have been presented at David's first trial, then maybe once found guilty, he would not have been sentenced to death. Where I wonder something else, Captain. And first off, I actually don't believe that it's true that Sheila was shooting at police or throwing hand grenades or any of that. I believe it was all David that night. Mm -hmm. But I wonder the opposite. Had this information been presented at his first trial, maybe it doesn't spare David's life, but maybe both end up receiving a death sentence because we have a cop that was killed on duty as well as several other attempts on lives of officers that came to help that officer that night. Right. I think that's a pretty good point. There were plenty of attempts to commute David's death sentence. There was the ongoing argument about what kind of prisoner David was. So again, the people that are against the death penalty come running to the front line and they say, David was a model prisoner. Once he got off the drugs, once he was behind bars, he never hurt anybody. He was the perfect prisoner and he even helped people. He taught people how to read and he was an advocate for uh, people that had disabilities. And I do we know if he was medicated or not? Once he was in prison, I don't know that he was medicated. I do believe he would have been medicated when he was at the hospital for the criminally insane. Right. And the way he ended up there, Captain, was once he was in prison, he refused to eat for several days. So it it looked like he was trying to end his own life. They transfer him there. He kind of gets right after several months, and then they send him back to death row. I commend David for helping all of these other prisoners, for teaching them to read and for Uh, being an advocate and standing up for people with disabilities. I think that is phenomenal stuff that he was attempting to do after he was a complete horrible person. Right. Well, and see David's David's whole thing is a very difficult situation for Mm -hmm. me. It's something, something that I struggle with because when we talk about the death sentence, it's, it's a crazy thing. I mean, here's this guy where without the drugs and without this, possible psychosis brought on by the prescribed medication. Right. Maybe he isn't a a killer. Maybe he isn't a violent man, but I did a little digging. He was not a perfect prisoner. He didn't spend all of those years in prison without any infractions at all. He had several minor infractions, but he was not the perfect prisoner that the people against the death penalty would, would scream and yell to the presses. Right. (laughs) We always find no matter if you're for the person or against the person, nobody really likes the truth. Right. But it's like, again, if this psychosis state plus the drugs, uh, this is why mental health is so important to be talked about and to be open about and to, again, you can't just prescribe pills and just go, let's see what happens because then this happens. Now who's responsible? Well, is this guy responsible or is the doctor responsible in, in the defense of the doctor, David's also still doing methamphetamine daily right at that time. And one thing that I recently learned about meth that I, that I was unaware of because I'm like, man, these, these meth heads are always killing people. And of course Mm -hmm. you think, Hey, they're going to do anything to get this drug. Some may even steal or become violent, but One thing I learned is that meth also will create paranoia in, in the addicted. Yeah. And they start thinking things that are not real. This person's after me, this family's trying to kill me. So in some of these instances, when they, when they go out and they kill somebody, they actually think that they're defending themselves. Well, see, I, I kind of wonder if you even take a a couple steps back, here's an individual that graduates high school at 16 valedictorian 
it maybe this whole tune in, tune on, whatever it is, this LSD experiments that he was going on, maybe this was some kind of self medication for maybe early onset schizophrenia. It's a possibility. And that's why I wondered, you know, is he doing fine? Is he um, a good member of the the prison population because he's medicated? And and then if so, is, is all these cause and effect not because he was a druggie, but because he was self-medicating because he had schizophrenia? It's impossible to tell, really. And that's the thing. If we could look at somebody and dissect them 100% and fully understand what was going on with them, then it would make the sentencing process a lot easier for the jury and all involved. I'm going to ask a weird question, but do we know if he got any scholarships? Uh, that is a good question. He may because of S- his SAT score was so high. Well, and you also talked said, about Here, the weird. Let's open up the doors and let this guy in. But you also talked about this weird thing about him predicting the future. Yeah. See, th- this is why I wonder. Maybe he got like the merit scholarship, which like the merit scholarship was known um, was connected to a bunch of different people. But in Harvard, uh, Henry Murray would do test a lot of people that got the the merit scholarship he would do test on famously uh, one of his people that he did a lot of test on was uh, Ted Kaczynski. So that's just why I wondered if there was some kind of connection. Normally when you have these very young, bright students that go to universities early, that sometimes they're offered these kind of alternative testing, but especially during the late 60s, early 70s. I don't know. With the Tim Leary quote, I just threw that in there. It's something that popped in my head when I thought of this young man who gets all caught up in the the subculture of that lifestyle. At, once he went off to college, the war activist is going on, or, or anti-war movement. He's going heavily into drugs. Yeah, but Timothy Leary was doing these tours where he was going from different universities and doing these yeah i'm not saying in, that, tune out whatever i'm not LSD saying that it's not trips. possible i'm just saying that 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 was just a, a slogan that popped into my mind that i just right. kind of randomly threw out there i i was there's never been presented to me or that i could find any connection between the two now, david lee powell was executed by the state of texas on tuesday june 15th 2010 he spent 32 years on death row for the 1978 murder of Austin police officer Ralph Ablanado. His attorneys had argued that he did not pose a future threat to society as determined by the juries that had sentenced him to death three decades earlier. At the time, he was the longest serving inmate executed in Texas since the state resumed carrying out executions in 1982. According to Murderpedia, His last meal was four eggs, four chicken drumsticks, salsa, four jalapeno peppers, lettuce, tortillas, hash browns, garlic bread, two pork chops, white and yellow grated cheese, sliced onions and tomatoes, a pitcher of milk, and a vanilla shake. Jesus. Well. How many calories is that? 10,000 calories? It doesn't really matter at that point now, does it? Yeah. And according to Everywhere... He had no final last words. He simply stared at the witnesses as he died before their eyes. Well, that's because he's probably already dead from that meal. Now, we don't know for sure. We don't know if he was medicated in prison or not. So we don't know if he had some kind of form of schizophrenia. But they believe that John Christian possibly had some sort of schizophrenia. Yeah, in in the other story... Of the 13-year-old who shot his teacher, during court proceedings, it was two psychiatrists that testified that John was acutely depressed and suffered from latent schizophrenia. And it was decided that psychiatric treatment for John was much needed. John was sent to Timberlawn Psychiatric Hospital, a private facility in Dallas, until his 18th birthday or until he recovered. 
Mm -hmm. John's family would be paying the bills for this treatment, not the taxpayers, per the judge's ruling. After 20 months at Timberlawn, John was upgraded to outpatient care. This was kind of a weird scenario here, Captain, because what they did was he was sent home, but not to his home. He was sent to the home of a doctor who would then be John's guardian, and John would continue to receive some form of outpatient care from this psychiatric facility. And we mentioned that his family was required to pay the bills for this treatment, I did the math on this and figured it up kind of conservatively, but for 20 months in this treatment facility, his family spent near $100,000 to treat this young man. John Christian did go on to college and law school. To this day, he is currently practicing law in the greater Austin area. Wow. Wilbur Rod Grayson was the English teacher at an independent Austin school district in Austin, Texas. Grayson was a graduate of the university of Texas at Arlington and was in his first year of teaching when he was killed on the job In Grayson's free time. He was an amateur actor. News reports reveal that American educators have been losing their lives in school tragedies since 1764. Members of the National Teachers Hall of Fame believe that it is time to recognize and honor these brave educators for their dedication to their jobs and to their students. Emporia State University in Kansas, in partnership with the National Teachers Hall of Fame, created a monument and memorial area that will be a permanent tribute to educators who literally gave their all for their profession. Yeah. This site is called the Memorial to Fallen Educators, which was designated as a national memorial in 2018. The names engraved on two granite slabs include teachers from Sandy Hook, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Santa Fe, and yes, Wilbur Rod Grayson from Murchison Junior High. Yeah, and one of the things I think uh, 2020 has taught a lot of us is how appreciative we should be towards a lot of our teachers. I know personally friends of mine that are having to homeschool some of their kids and just the difficulty of one, trying to get them excited to learn it, uh, but also to understand the information themselves and to give it back. So, so a big shout out to all the teachers out there. And I think a shout out to all of the police officers on the Austin city PD, as well as all the educators and students that were at Murchison Junior High on that very tragic day, Thursday, May 18th, 1978, a day that started with tragedy and ended with tragedy. For everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com and there you'll find our recommended reading page. Do we have any recommended reading for this week? Yes, sir, Captain. This week we are recommending one of my favorites. Check out Texas Monthly Magazine. Texas Monthly does several absolutely brilliant long-form true crime stories each year. Robert Draper did one on the Grayson case that we covered today back in April. That's Texas Monthly. Find that and many more great recommendations at truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.